How many have already made it out to the cemetery? A few of us? Uh, we, we went to uh, Greeley yesterday where a lot of my relatives are buried. Then we went to Adams Cemetery where the rest of them are buried pretty much. And uh, that's near Bunker, Missouri, quite a, quite a good distance from here. And uh, so we are in that time of, of remembering those who've gone on before us, particularly those who gave, up, gave their lives in service uh, to our military. Uh, my father was in the Navy and uh, that other relatives uh, serve in, in the military. I'm sure you have too. And whether they died in, in the uh, you know in a war or whatever, we, we still remember their service and praise God for their service. But it occurs to me as as we're going through our series of messages here on all the king's men, you know, we all need to be men and women uh, like those who've gone on before us, who've given us that example, and now we need to stand. And, and be the kind of, of uh, exemplary uh, folks that uh, those who come behind us will look and, and remember, you know, the, the kind of service we gave not only to our country, but to our Lord and uh, to uh, our fellow man as we uh, attempt to be the kind of people God wants us to be. So let's, let's strive for that as we look at these messages now. This next message concerning the man who took a stand 2 Samuel 23, 11. Now, after him was Shema, the son of Aji, a Herorite. And the Philistines were gathered into a troop where there was a plot of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. Well, let's pray. Father God, as we study this next man this morning, we pray that you'd speak to our hearts. Uh, that we would be the kind of, of people that you want us to be, Lord. That you would call us. To serve you in, in uh, honor and strength and courage and might. Lord, we call upon your Holy Spirit's power to indwell each of us, Lord, and, and that we would experience your power and your presence as we, day by day, surrender ourselves more fully to you and seek to be the kind of people you're calling us to be. Lord, we pray and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Shema. Or as, as, as we uh, talk about here, he's the son of Aji, the Herorite. Shema, the name means waste. Possibly he's the father of Jonathan, one of the 30 in 2 Samuel 23, 33, this Shema. We know very little else about this member of the trio of mighty men except the episode that's reported here going to be looking at. Many of, of, of the conflicts of the Philistines stem from border raids on crops. You have to understand in those days, crops, you know, that's how you sustain yourself. That's how you live. That, you, know, you have to eat in order to survive. And, and much like those marauding Midianites earlier in Israel's history in Judges 6, 1 through 6 and verse 11, in this case, a band of Philistines rendezvoused near a field of lentils, okay, a field of beans, to fight for its possession and to take the crop for themselves and, and feed, you know, their people. The rest of Israel's troops fled, but Shema stayed and single-handedly drove away the raiders and saved the crop for their people so that they wouldn't starve. David's son... <laughs> Jesus Christ is looking for a few good people like Shema, people who will be willing to take a stand for him. Shema shows, first of all, when to stand. When to stand. Neither too soon nor too late, but at the exact moment of attack, Shema took his stand. And I would imagine there were plenty of folks who were willing to take a stand before the invaders came, but... Those folks couldn't be found when the trumpet blew for battle and it was actually time to be there and to defend their food. Uh, surely some were willing to take a stand after the fight was finished. You know, perhaps they hoped to get some of the credit for the victory and share in its glory, even though they'd already hightailed it and only came back after the victory was won. But when the attackers came, 
Only one man was found to take a stand, and that man was Shema. Not before the crisis, nor after the crisis, but in the very moment of crisis when it really counted, Shema is the man who took a stand. And as I said, David's son, Jesus Christ, is looking for a few good people, a few good men and women like Shema, people who take a stand in the day of evil when the enemies of God come in like a flood. I think we're in those days right now, aren't we? The Apostle Paul put it like this in Ephesians 6.13, Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Our Lord needs people who take a stand in, the, in this moment of crisis, not before it, not after it, but when it happens, He needs people who will stand up for Him. I'm reminded of the story about Eminem's candies. Seems they were offered the chance to be the official candy of a major motion picture. But they hesitated to agree to be the candy of this movie. And the film producers went to a similar product, Reese's Pieces. The movie, of course, turned out to be E.T., the extraterrestrial, and Reese's Pieces sales went up more than 300% after that movie was released. Who knows all that they may have missed in history, the history of their company by that moment. Who knows what others may have missed in their lives by a moment's hesitation. Surely Jesus offered the opportunity to follow him to some who've drawn back and may have missed him forever. Some argued they had family obligations, they needed greater material security so they, they couldn't step out in faith. You recall what happened? Look at Luke 9, 57 through 62 with me. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Talking to Jesus. Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord. But first permit me to go say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. At least one fellow we know of went away with went away from Jesus in sadness because he had too much of this world to want the next. That rich young ruler, of course, we're talking about. We're living in turmoil, it seems, in our day and age. Changes come daily. Political changes, economic changes, social changes. The son of David needs people like Shema, people who step up and take a stand People who stand up for the poor, people who stand up for the elderly, people who stand up for the unborn, people who stand up for the Bible, the right to free speech and the ability to share your, your, your testimony, your faith in Christ, people who stand up against sins like marital infidelity, drug and alcohol abuse, homosexuality, people who stand against false theology like humanism and Mormonism and perversions of any kind, really. People who will stand for Christ no matter what it costs. It's difficult. It's heart-wrenching. It brings tears. But notice now how to stand. Shema stood alone. Do you see that scene there in... in 2 Samuel, the battle of the trumpets blew. Yonder, over the hill, comes the Philistine horde going to attack and take over the field of beans. And so terrified by the advancing guerrillas coming at them, the Israelites working in the fields just dropped their tools and ran for cover. You know? But Shema wasn't intimidated either by their flight or by the foe that was coming at him. 
Others fled, just simply ran away in fear, but he stood even though he stood alone. History reminds us of similar heroes. Back in 1948, I read where after a southern bolt from the party at the National Convention, President Harry S. Truman issued executive orders banning racial bias in the armed forces and in federal civil service. The opinion of many in that day was that the president's action would blast his chances to win a full term in the coming election, but not only, of course, did he win, but he continued speaking his conviction about equal rights boldly. Once a Democratic National Committee woman from a southern state questioned one of his statements on civil rights, saying she was sure the president hadn't meant what he said, but Mr. Truman replied by saying, I said what I said because I meant it, and I have no intention in any way whatsoever to take back one word. The Bill of Rights applies to everybody in our country. Don't forget it, he said. Don't you forget it. The Apostle Paul was another one who spoke boldly, even when it wasn't the popular thing to do, the political thing to do. He prayed for strength and for wisdom to open his mouth boldly and to make known the mystery of the gospel. Here's how he said it in Ephesians 6, 18 through 20. He said, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Do we pray that way? That we would speak boldly about our faith? Or do we kind of timidly share with others what we believe? David's son Jesus Christ is looking for a few good people like Shema. People who are willing to stand even if it means standing all by themselves. Too many of, of Christ's followers stand only if someone else stands with them. Jesus needs disciples who aren't afraid to take a solitary stand for it. Notice also that Shema knew where to stand. No Philistine had to search for Shammah to find him in order to engage him in battle. There was no question about where he stood or on whose side of the fight he belonged. Again, history gives us a similar example. There was a little Atlanta lady, a little woman in Atlanta, armed with a broom. There's a little, little slide depicting trying to depict the, the historical event. This little lady confronted General, General Sherman's troops on their march to the sea in the war between the states. A cal cavalryman swung down from his saddle and led her gently to the sidewalk. He said to her, surely you don't think you can defeat the Union Army with a broom, do you? Perhaps not, she replied, but I want there to be no doubt as to whose side I'm on. On the other hand, the comment of a man I read about in Reader's Digest illustrates the effort of many, that many people exert to avoid taking a stand for their convictions. And it said, in County Fermanagh, Northern Ireland, a man stood in the middle of a narrow piece of wood that spanned a small rushing stream. Feeling his precarious bridge giving way beneath him, he exclaimed to the open skies, God is good, and the devil isn't bad either. That won't do in our service to the Lord, will it? King Jesus wants people who aren't afraid to let it be known whose side they stand on. Which side are you standing? Finally, let's consider why to stand. The plot of ground Shema defended was only a field full of lentils. Just a bean field. Nothing but a patch of beans. Some of Shammah's fellow Israelites didn't think it worth defending, especially if they were going to risk life and limb, so they ran off. But Shammah thought, no, not only do we need the food, but there's a principle here. 
he had a firm conviction about the value of the land under attack. And maybe, maybe this was his reasoning. This land is a part of our inheritance. God gave it to us. Didn't the Lord say to Joshua, I will give you every place where your foot, where you set your foot in Joshua 1.3? Why should we abandon this to the Philistines? It's ours. This is our land. It's not theirs. And furthermore, we're the ones who plowed this crop. We're the ones who hoed this crop. It's our crop. It wouldn't be here if we hadn't worked it. In other words, these are our beans, not your beans. So Shema decided to defend this patch and the beans in it from these hostile hands who were coming to rob and destroy. Listen to these words in Jude 1 3. It says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. Now what's that word that he uses here about the faith? Contend earnestly for it. Think about your life, how you stand for the Lord. With would the term contend earnestly, would that fit with your lifestyle, with the things you do, the things you say, and the way you witness? Do you contend earnestly for the faith? In this day when hostile forces threaten the faith of our fathers, the inheritance once for all delivered to the saints, the son of David is looking for a few good people like Shema. People who refuse to give up their inheritance and the fruit of their hands, the fruit of faithful men of God, so easily. People willing to take a stand for God. The August 6, 1984 issue of Time Magazine carried many articles, and in particular carried a lot of articles about the 1984 Olympics that had been held in Los Angeles. One of the articles was on the gala's opening ceremonies, and one of the planned activities during the national anthem that never came to pass. It never happened. There was an eagle that was supposed to fly into the stadium and land on one of the five circles symbolizing the Olympics. The eagle they found for this job was in a wildlife area in Laurel, Maryland. The eagle's name was Bomber. He was 22 years old. Bomber had been caged since he was a little eaglet. His trainer, Steve Hottie, gained Bomber's confidence in, in various ways and began teaching Bomber how to fly. However, one day, before he could make his epic flight during the Olympics, Bomber died. The cause of death was cardiovascular collapse. Bomber hadn't flown for 20 years, and he'd gotten lazy. He got fat, out of shape. When he was called upon to perform like an eagle, he failed. I think the application is, is so much like modern day Christianity. Many Christians, many of us have to admit, we've become lazy. Spiritually fat, out of shape. When we're called on to perform like Christians ought to perform, we fail. Too often we fail. Of course, we all think about Isaiah 40, 31. When we talk about eagles in the, in the spiritual context, you know, they mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not get tired and walk and not become weary. But I think we should also think about Psalm 103, 5 which says, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. Why does the psalmist ask that our youth be renewed like the eagles? Well, for us Americans, the eagle, of course, is a very powerful, a particularly powerful uh, 
handsome bird, an emblem of strength and beauty that we have as our national anthem, our national emblem that we, we really enjoy. That picture of the eagle and you know, the idea that it represents us as Americans. However, the eagle had an additional meaning for the ancient Hebrews because, and you may not know this, but the eagle molds. You know what that means? It, it sheds its feathers and regrows its feathers. All its feathers. Sheds them and regrows them annually. Therefore, they viewed the eagle as, as having a new life each year because it did that. Like the phoenix, you know, new life emerged from the old. And, you know, how can we enjoy the gift of renewed life that the eagle symbolizes? Every day we can ask, what can I learn about God's world that I don't know yet? What can I discover in God's word that I don't know yet? If we have inquisitive minds, we can continually grow in our appreciation of God's handiwork. No matter how many years we've lived, we can, we can grow in our appreciation of what God has given to us in His Word, how He teaches us and, and guides us and directs us. In 1 Peter 1.13, God's Word says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. A lot of words there, but particularly a lot of meaning. Prepare your minds for action. I don't think that's kind of our attitude as Christians. We're, we're prepared to just kind of sit around a while, you know. Prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Someone once said, what God expects us to attempt, he also enables us to achieve. Someone else explained that without God, we can't. Without us, he won't. The truth is that when the call for service comes, too often Christians give some excuse of weakness or inability or lack of training. You know, just don't know how. Unfortunately, we, we fail to count on the omnipotence of God to take our small talents and to use them for the accomplishment of His purposes. He promises to us that He will enable us in the moment when we're in that time of testing. D.L. Moody one time told the story of a passenger on an Atlantic steamer who lay in his bunk during a raging storm, had a severe case of seasickness. I can imagine. Suddenly he heard the cry as he's laying there in agony trying not to throw up again. He hears the cry, man overboard. And so, you know, he's just still kind of getting over when he's going through. You know, he sends up a prayer, you know, God, God, oh, may God help that poor fellow. But there's nothing I can do. You know, he's laying there in agony. And then he thought, well, I've got a lantern here. I can set my lantern in the window at least. Maybe that, you know, probably won't mean anything, but I could at least do that. And, and, and so he, he did so. Took, it, took a lot of effort because he was still trying to keep everything down, you know. Picked up the lantern, set it up in the window. The man who had fallen overboard was finally rescued. And in retelling the story the next day, he said, I was going down in the darkness for the last time when somebody put a lantern in the porthole. It shone on my hand and the sailor in the lifeboat grabbed it and pulled me in. In other words, weakness is no excuse for not putting forth what effort we do have. Who can tell how God will work? It may seem like a little thing, but if it's something that, that you feel, you know, you, you heard a voice from God, you should do that. 
Surely you can do that. Right now, the son of David is looking for people like Shem. People who will stand up and be counted as Christians, both in word and in deed. People willing to do what they can do. Even though it may not be much, it might be a lot. Do what you can do, because who knows who might be saved, whose life might be transformed, because you're willing to put forth that effort. Well, let's stand together. We're going to sing a song, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Are you willing to stand for the Lord today? Let's stand up and be counted for Him. Let's stand up and serve Him and do what He's calling each of us to do. Let's stand together. <laughs> 